Does anybody need a handout this morning? Anybody need a handout, Lupita? Anybody else? Sister Carrie, do you need one? Oh, you got one? All right. All right, praise the Lord. Joseph, we're going to sit down and be quiet, okay? But we're not going to move, okay? We're going to respect the Lord and his word, right? All right, let me put this down over here. All right, well, it's been a pretty good series, amen? We're on our 13th week uh, this week on uh, the topic of, what's what's the topic? Uh, heroes. Heroes of the faith. Legends. Legends of the faith. Legends of the faith. Amen. I should know that, right? <laughs> Legends of the faith, but we've uh, we've studied some amazing uh, men and women of the Bible. Praise the Lord. Uh, this week, what we're going to do is we're going to study the life of Jonathan. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, studied the life of Jonathan, he was the son of King Saul. Y'all remember King Saul? King Saul was so stubborn, right? He had so much bitterness in his heart towards David. And, uh, you know, he started out... Uh, very well. He was very humble in his eyes when Samuel anointed him to be king. And the Bible says he was very tall, right? He's probably a handsome man. But uh, the Bible says that he was he was lifted up in pride. First Samuel 15, if you study the life of Sam of Saul, uh, he didn't obey the Lord fully. God told him to go and destroy all the Amalekites, and uh, and the Bible says that uh, he did, but he spared the king of Agag. Uh, he kept them alive, and he spared the sheep, and he didn't do a good job. He didn't obey the Lord. But Jonathan, his son, was a godly man. He loved the Lord, and he didn't like what uh, what his dad Saul was up to. His dad Saul was uh, had bitterness in his heart towards David. Y'all, if y'all study your Bible in First Samuel seventeen, y'all remember when uh, when there was uh, a giant, the Philistine, Goliath of Gath came up against the children of Israel and he was defying the armies of the living God. And the Bible says that uh, David, a shepherd boy, went out and he took him out. Right? Joseph, quiet. Okay. Quiet. So uh, David took out Goliath there, praise the Lord. But then all the women, as David was coming down, all the women said that uh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his... Ten thousands, right? So what were they doing? They were basically elevating a little shepherd boy, a teenage shepherd boy, above the king, King Saul. And when King Saul heard that, he wasn't pleased with that. Though so that that saying really just uh, made him wrong, and uh, he was really upset with that. And the Bible says that he eyed David from that time forward. Well, he had a bitterness in his heart towards David, but Jonathan, his son. Loved David. Jonathan, his son, saw how, how the Lord was all over David and, and how David was a, a goodly man. Look with me, if you will. Uh, open your Bibles if you have your Bible. 1 Samuel chapter number, let me see here. 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. The Bible says this in verse 1. Uh, by the way, this is the last week of our series. Um, studying the legends of the faith and next week brother Dan's going to kick it off and we're going to start a new series on the life of Paul amen the life of Paul Paul was an amazing man of God and uh, he was the uh, author inspired fully of the Holy Spirit of most of the New Testament amen most of the New Testament so Saul so Saul which later became Paul the great apostle Paul we're going to study his life uh, during this next series. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a, what's that word? A covenant. Because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even his sword, and to his bow and to his girdle. Now you think about this. Uh, Jonathan and David made a covenant with each other. They loved each other. I love how the Bible says this, that Jonathan loved him as his own soul. That's very, very powerful. Amen. 
Jonathan loved him as much as he loved himself. When he saw David, he saw Almighty God all over David. He understood and knew that it was impossible for a little shepherd boy. Now David wasn't this big muscular man when he went and faced Goliath. Now, if we just uh, take an, uh, you know, an image you know, and, and just kind of think about Goliath of Gath, this man was almost 10 feet tall, right? This man was a, was a warrior, a soldier, and, uh, and David wasn't afraid of him. You know, everybody was afraid of him, but David wasn't afraid. Why? Because he had strong faith, amen? He had faith in the living God, and he understood and knew that it's nothing in me, it's nothing that I could do, it's not by my strength, it's not by my might, but it's by Almighty God that I could take this giant out. And Jonathan saw that in David, and he loved David with all of his heart, and he made a covenant with David. And you know, this is truly amazing here in verse 4 of 1 Samuel 18, the Bible says, And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him, and he gave it to David. That's very powerful. You know, I don't want to get too far into my message because we're going to get into that a little bit down the, down the line here. But you think about Saul is king, Jonathan is Saul's son. So when Saul passes away, who's supposed to be the next one heir on the throne? It's supposed to be Jonathan, right? So what did Jonathan do? He humbled himself. He took off his robe, his royal attire, Brother Gilbert, and he put it on David. You know what that is? That's a complete act of humility. You know what he's telling them? He's telling them, yes, I should be heir in line after my father. But you know what? I know that God is going to make you king one day. Isn't that amazing? He was a, a man of great humility. Let me give you this introduction here. Jesus is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. As a songwriter said, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. This can be lowly. This can be a lonely world, and people are hungry for true friendship. An examination of Jonathan's life will reveal several attributes that should be a part of every good friendship. Let me give you your first fill in the blank here. Number one, a strengthening friendship. A strengthening friendship. In the world today, most people view a friendship as a relationship from which they can gain something. Jonathan's life, however, typified a friendship that was characterized by giving rather than receiving. Jonathan gave strength to David at a time when David needed it most. Two friends standing together should be stronger than either one could be alone. Friends strengthen each other. When one is weak, the others can be strong to help that friend in need. Thinking of Aaron and her, how they lifted up uh, Moses' hands as they were, as the children of Israel were fighting against the Amalekites. As we fight the battles of our life, we much appreciate those friends who stand before us. Uh, if you have your Bible, look with me at Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter number four, Ecclesiastes chapter number four. And the Bible says this, Ecclesiastes chapter number four. Look at verse number nine with me. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Verse 11. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall, with, uh, two shall withstand him. And a three-fold cold is not quickly broken. You see what the Bible says now? We know that Solomon, the wisest man upon the earth, penned these words down in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he's, and he's basically saying that two is better than one. Amen. Two is better than one. You know, have you ever had... A time in your life to where you've been you've been discouraged, you've been sad, you've been brokenhearted, and then you know someone will come along, Lupita, right, and just say some beautiful words. I um, I was so discouraged because I had a flat tire in the desert of the Mojave. Wow. And a Volkswagen when I was a teenager, and the semis would pass by, and I was so you know. 
discouraged because I, I didn't know how to change a tire. Right. So did someone come along and help you? Yes, out of the blues. And it, the sun was going down and I was getting scared because I waited a long time. Wow, but the Lord sent someone to help you? Praise the Lord. You know, Jonathan, as we're studying the life of Jonathan, Jonathan was a true friend. Amen. Jonathan not only uh, spoke to David kindly, but he truly, with all of his heart, was that true friend to help uh, David during the toughest times of his life. You say, what were the, some of the toughest times of David's life? Well, remember, uh, a majority of his life, David was running from, from Saul. Remember how Saul was trying to take David out. Saul was constantly on the move trying to kill David. But David, um, if you look here with me at 1 Samuel, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter number 18. 1 Samuel, let me see if I can get here. 1 Samuel 18, this wasn't in my notes, but I'll just uh, I'll read these verses to you. The Bible says this in 1 Samuel 18, look at verse 6. Uh, look at verse 5, I'm sorry. And David went out, whithersoever Saul sent him, and the Bible says this, and he behaved himself wisely. I love that part. Look at verse number 14. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was what? The Lord was with him. You think about that. Now, now if you look at verse 8, and Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him when the women sang. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and unto me they have ascribed but thousands. And what more can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the javelin. For he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence. How many times? Twice, the Bible says. So you think about this. We're studying the life of Jonathan. I want to focus on Jonathan. But Saul, King Saul, was very wroth. That, that, that word there, very wroth, means he was very extremely anger, angry at David. And he wanted to take David out. But I love this part, how the Bible says, David behaved himself wisely. David behaved himself wisely. Now, there's a lot we can learn from that. If you have an enemy, my brothers and sisters, and your enemy just uh, is bad-mouthing you, your enemy is, uh, is uh, ridiculing you, mocking you, your enemy wants to hurt or to harm you, right? Behave yourself wisely. Amen? Behave yourself wisely. You say, why? Because God is watching, right? God is watching. And God will avenge you over that thing, right? God will, will end up blessing your life and, and if you study the life of Saul and David what happened was God ended up renting the kingdom from Saul and giving it to who? Okay. Giving it to David. Okay. Amen. Yeah. So did God avenge that? Absolutely. Saul ended up dying a horrific death as well. But, uh, but Jonathan was supposed to take his father's side. Right? You know my son is uh, very young but I hope one day when he grows up he's going to take my side. But I also hope that he's going to judge for himself. And he's going, to, he's going to think and say, you know what? My dad is wrong in this area. I need to judge righteously. And that's exactly what Jonathan did. Jonathan took the side of David over his own father. Saul was trying to kill David without a cause. Uh, if you look here with me, look at 1 Samuel uh, chapter. Let me see if I can find it here. 1 Samuel chapter number, uh, look with me at 28. 1 Samuel chapter 28. Let's see if I can find this here. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, 1 Samuel, it's not 28. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 23. 1 Samuel 23. Uh, okay, look what the Bible says in 1 Samuel 23 verse 14. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Sith 
And Saul sought him, what does that say? Every day. Every day. But God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan, Jonathan Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. Now you think about that. Now, Saul sought David every day, the Bible says. You think about that. How much bitterness does Saul have in his heart? Every single, imagine every single morning you wake up and the first thing you think about, you don't think about God, you don't think about praying, you don't think about, Lord, thank you for this day. The first thing you think about, I got to kill David. That's a lot of bitterness to have on your heart. That's really heavy for something to carry. So what David's doing is David's running for his life, right? He's running away from, from, Dave, from Saul. But I love this part. In verse 16, the Bible says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. I can only imagine Jonathan rising up early in the morning and thinking, you know, I, I got to go and comfort David. I can only imagine my, my evil father. He's trying to kill David without a cause. David never did anything wrong. You know, in, in fact, David avenged Israel. Remember how the Philistines were going to come up? They had this giant uh, Goliath of Gath. They were going to destroy Israel. But because of, of David's faith, he went and he took out that problem that Israel had. I need to go over there and I need to strengthen him. I need to bless him. I need to say some encouraging words to him. So number one, you're filling the blank. Jonathan was had a strengthening friendship with David. He had a strengthening friendship with David. Let me give you your fill in the blank here. A, Jonathan sought David physically. He sought David physically. We read in 1 Samuel 23, verse 16, and Saul's, uh, Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood, and he strengthened his hand in God. Uh, he also strengthened David spiritually. B, you're fill in the blank here. He strengthened David spiritually. Nor, if he's not going to stop talking, we have to take him out. Okay? That's, it's disturbing the class. Please. You need to stop talking, Joseph. Okay? okay. He strengthened David spiritually. Uh, he strengthened his hand in God. I can only imagine how the conversation went as he went and as Jonathan sought David. He was probably telling him, listen, the same God that helped you defeat Goliath is going to be the same God that's going to help you against my dad. David, don't ever forget God. God is with you. You know, God will strengthen you. I know you're in a really tough uh, situation right now. I know you might be a little bit discouraged. Uh, I know you might be a little bit afraid because of, of Saul, you know, chasing you and, and sending men to want to wanna take you out. But listen, have faith in God, my friend. Have faith in God. Listen, that's a true friend. Amen. Are you being a true friend, my brothers and sisters, to someone who's in need? You know, there's a lot of people out there. This world is, is getting darker by the day. But when, we, when people come to us for advice or when people come to us, are we encouraging them or are we discouraging them? You know, God the Father, last week as we studied the life of Joseph and we made some comparisons uh, to Jesus. Remember how the heavens opened when Jesus was baptized? And, the, and God the Father said, this is my beloved son. And whom I will please. You know what God the Father was doing? He was speaking life into his son. He was speaking words of edification. He was speaking words of encouragement unto his son. Jonathan was speaking words of edification unto David, his friend. He was speaking words of life unto him. He was strengthening, strengthening his hand. Amen. Uh, let me give you uh, B. I'm sorry, two. You're filling the blank. Two. He had a giving friendship. He had a giving friendship. You say, what did he give? He gave his time. You know how you spell love? You don't spell love, L-O-V-E. You spell love, T-I-M-E. Amen? If you love someone, you're going to spend time with them. Right? It could be said that love is spelled T-I-M-E. This could include of giving of time, and it could uh, be sharing of your material gifts. But there's no question that when we love someone, we desire to give to them. When we give to them, when we give gifts, that's basically saying, I love you. I care about you. I, I care about you more than even myself because I'm not giving you the cheap scraps, if you will. I'm giving you uh, of good possessions. Jonathan didn't give things to David that were just cheap materialistic things. 
The Bible says that he took his robe off of himself and he put it upon David. What is that? That's something very, very valuable. You know what he's telling him? He's telling him, listen, I, I, I'm supposed to be second in line to be king, but I'm going to give this to you and I'm going to, I'm going to make you first and I'm going to get behind you and I'm going to be second. I'm going to put you above myself. That's, that's a, a true giving uh, friendship there. Uh, let me give you A. He gave of his possessions under two. He gave of his possessions. In 1 Samuel 18, verse 3 and 4, we read these. Uh, then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved them as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him, and he gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Listen, during, during these times in 1 Samuel, during the times of the kings, they were constantly going to battle. And you know what Jonathan did? David, uh, Jonathan stripped himself of his armor. He stripped himself of his bow, of his sword, of his girdle. And the Bible says that he gave it unto David to protect himself. That's a true friend. Amen. He truly cared about, about David more than even himself. You know, one thing that I can say about Jonathan is he wasn't selfish. He wasn't selfish. He was selfless. Amen. You think about the Lord Jesus for a second. Jesus was not selfish, right? Jesus, Jesus could have very easily said, you know what? I, I'm not going to go down there upon that, that the dirty, filthy earth full of sin. And I'm not going to leave the streets of gold of my throne in heaven and my royal attire and the angels falling down and worshiping me, you know, uh, throughout the day. I'm not going to leave all that to go down and to be mocked and ridiculed and falsely accused to be spit upon and, and to be to be crucified to have the the crown of thorns upon my head and to and to be and, and to go to prison i'm not going to do all that the bible says in, in fastings often you know jesus fasted often and and oftentimes he was hungry and thirsty and and jesus said this he says foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Listen, those aren't comfortable words, right? He wasn't comfortable. He didn't live his life in comfort in some kind of a mansion, right? Wearing royal attire. No, he was a carpenter, right? Trying to compare this to Jonathan. Jesus was not selfish, just like how Jonathan was not selfish. They were selfless, amen? And Jesus went to the cross willingly, Jonathan put his life on the line willingly for his friend David. You say, how did he put his life on the line? Because Saul could have killed Jonathan. Just like how Saul had so much bitterness and evil in his heart that he wanted to kill David, he would have took his own son out. And in fact, the Bible tells us that he tried to take his son out. But Jonathan was very wise in his words. He was very gracious in his words. And he basically told him, Father, you know, John, uh, David is the one who took out Goliath. He helped Israel. David never did anything wrong. He behaved himself wisely. Why are you trying to kill uh, David? Why are you trying to come against me for being his friend? You know, I'm paraphrasing here the words, but I can only imagine how that conversation went down to where Jonathan didn't put gasoline on fire. Jonathan put water upon fire. He put a fire extinguisher to the fire and he tried to calm his father down. He was a peacemaker. Amen. And it, it wasn't Jesus a peacemaker. Didn't Jesus always try to make peace? That's the same thing that we should do. If we take some of the attributes from Jonathan about how he was selfless, about how he gave of his possessions, how he gave of his time, how he loved genuinely, how he was selfless, we need to have those kind of attributes in our life. Amen. Let me give you B. He gave of his position. He gave of his possession. Uh, 1 Samuel 23, 17. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and that also Saul my father knoweth it. What kind of words of encouragement are these to David? He's giving of his position. His position to the royal throne. He should be next in line. And he's saying, listen, I'm going to be second to you. Right? He gave, of a, a, he gave his promise. See, he gave his promise. 1 Samuel 20, verse 4. Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. I'm going to give you even, I'm going to promise you 
that uh, I'm going to be a true friend to you. No matter what you need, I'm going to be there for you, David. You're not alone. I'm here with you. It's interesting that Jonathan gave not only in the present moment, but he promised to help fulfill future needs. The challenging truth of this passage is that Jonathan's desire to aid his friend had no boundaries at all. He said, whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will do it. There was no limitation on what Jonathan would do to attempt to be a true friend unto David. Let me give you number three. Number three. He, he gave a warning to him. He had a warning friendship. He had a warning friendship. You say, what do you mean he had a warning for David? He warned, da he warned David that when Saul was going to kill him or not. Because remember, Jonathan was, a, was the son of the king, and he overheard the conversations going on in the palace, right? And as he overheard the conversations going on in the palace, what did he do? He basically betrayed his father, and rightfully so, and he went and told his friend, listen, I overheard this conversation my father's talking about in this specific time. He's going to send soldiers out, and he's going to take your life. So you need to flee to this place. He warned him. And listen... Aren't we supposed to warn others out of love? Right? Yes. Look with me, if you will. Look at Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel really quick. Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. These, these, Bible, these Bible verses in Ezekiel 33 are very powerful and very scary at the same time. But this is something that we all should do. Look at what the Bible says in verse number 7. Ezekiel 33, 7. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee as a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and, what does that say? Warn them. Now he doesn't say for me, from me. Okay, let's, let's, let's back up here. Let's read this one more time. God is speaking here unto Ezekiel, the watchman. And he's saying, so thou, O son of man, I have set thee as a watchman unto the house of Israel. What is he saying? I've made you a prophet, Ezekiel, unto the house of Israel. Now what I want you to do is I have a job for you, Ezekiel. I want you, therefore, thou shalt hear the word of my mouth. Remember, he's a prophet. God used to speak unto the man of God, the seer, the prophet. And then that prophet would go and, they, and say, thus saith the Lord, and give the message from Almighty God. Well, God's message... To Ezekiel, to the children of Israel was this. He says, Thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Not warn them for me, from me. What is God saying? God's saying, I'm a, I'm a God of judgment and I'm a God of wrath. Yes, I'm a God of love. Yes, I'm a God of patience. I'm a God of mercy. But the children of Israel kept pushing God's buttons, if you will. And God was saying, listen, I'm going to send a prophet. This man, Ezekiel, and he's going to hear the word of my mouth and he's going to warn them from me. What does that mean? I'm getting ready to destroy the children of Israel and I'm going to lead them into captivity. I'm going to send King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, this is upcoming. King Nebuchadnezzar. And what he's going to do is he's going to take them into captivity into Babylon. So I want you to warn them from me, from my wrath, from my judgment, from the captivity that is to come. Jonathan, he warned his friend. Ezekiel warned the children of Israel from wrath that was upcoming. And listen, that's exactly what we should do today. You say, what do you mean? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to warn sinners that there's an upcoming judgment with love. Amen? We're supposed to blow the trumpet. Listen, Jesus is, is coming soon. Please repent of your sins. Please give your life to Jesus. Amen? That's a true friend. Right? Listen... Let me, let me ask you this question. Imagine there's a worldwide pandemic, epidemic, right? And you have, you're the only person in the world that has the cure to this worldwide disease, this worldwide plague. Are you going to be quiet about it? No. You're going to blow the trumpet, amen? Brenda, you're going to talk and you're going to tell people, you're going to warn people, listen, this is, this is the answer. Well, listen, there's a worldwide problem. You know what it's called? It's a three-letter word. It's called sin. But praise God, glory, hallelujah, that God has given us the answer. 
but are we being quiet about it? Are we, are we, see, we know the answer. The answer is Jesus, right? But are we warning people out of love? You see, Jonathan warned David and said, listen, my brother David, I love you. Flee. Please get, get out of this place because my dad's wrath is coming. He's going to send the soldiers out to kill you, right? Ezekiel warned the children of Israel from wrath that was coming, right? And, and, and listen, wrath is coming. The Bible said there's a time called Jacob's trouble. It's a time of the great tribulation for seven years here upon this earth when God catches the church away, when God raptures the church away. Praise God, we're not going to be here for that seven years. There's, there's going to be great wrath that is going to be coming. Are we warning people from that, from that time? And if not, we should be. Amen? Can I get an amen? amen? We should be, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Let me read some of the words to you here of Jesus, our Savior, in Matthew chapter number 28. We all know these words, Matthew 28. The Bible says this, speaking about warning, Jesus said this in verse 18 of Matthew 28, And Jesus came and spake unto them, his disciples, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, don't be afraid. Listen, I'm with you. All power has been given to me in heaven and earth, and I'm with you. Don't be afraid. And th this is what he says. He says, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Don't be afraid, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You know why a lot of us don't blow the trumpet, and a lot of us don't warn, and a lot of us don't go? Because we're afraid. You see, Jonathan, Jonathan could have said the same thing. His excuse could have been, I'm afraid of my dad Saul will kill me if I go and leak this information to David. I'm afraid. My life is on the line. My, my dad Saul will kill me if I go and tell David some of the things that, that my dad is saying in the palace. But he didn't care. He wasn't afraid. He knew it was the right thing to do. Amen. And listen, these days... A lot of Christians are becoming cowardly and becoming fearful even when it's the right thing to do. They're just being quiet about it. They're not standing up and speaking the truth. Amen. Out of love. I'm not telling you to go and, and to, you know, Bible thump people over the head. But listen, when, it's a, when there's a time to speak, we speak. Whether, when there's a time to be quiet, we be quiet. Amen. But God tells us to go and to warn those people for me. Jonathan warned David to be able to flee. Let me give you A, under three. A, it was timely. The message was timely. Let me give you this true story. The, uh, we used to attend uh, a church, uh, my wife and I, uh, years back. I don't need to mention the church, but uh, the pastor of the church and another church member, I wasn't there, but I, I heard the story and I do believe it. Um, they went soul winning and the pastor was knocking on the door of this house and uh, there was no answer and uh, they knocked again and there was no answer and the pastor backed up to leave but the, the man, the other man that was there said, you know what, let me just knock just one more time and they gave it, they gave it a, a good knock and uh, they heard footsteps coming to the door and then this little old lady opened up the door and she said, uh, you know, how can I help you? And uh, they said, well, ma'am, you know, we're just here from, you know, this church and we just want to invite you to church. And uh, do you have a church family that you're a part of? And uh, she said, I don't have a church family that I'm a part of. This is a very dark time in my life. And uh, you've come in a very timely you know, we're, we're talking about timely. You've come in a very timely time to come and to bring this message to me. The lady had, was in the living room. She had a rope that was tied. This little old lady climbed up on a chair, tied up a rope, and she was getting ready to hang herself. She ran out of food. She ran out of money. The government wasn't assisting her anymore. Somehow, some way, her government aid got cut out. And uh, that pastor and that man were able to lead her to Christ and save that lady's soul. Amen? Amen. Very timely. Listen, 
Jesus says, I come as a thief in the night. Mm -hmm. Timely. Do you know the, the, the time or the hour that a thief is going to come and he's going to break into your house? No. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Yes. Yes. Listen, Ransom. we're... We're, yes, we're very comfortable in this world, right? Mm -hmm. But I want to remind you, my brothers and sisters, that we're not a part of this world. This world is not our home. Brother Al, Jesus can catch us tonight, catch us away tonight. Jesus can come back tonight. Mm -hmm. If he comes back tonight, very timely, his timing is precise, right? Have we done enough for him? Have we done enough for him? If we stand before him tonight, if he comes back, are we going to say, Lord, I, I just, I feel ashamed because I haven't done enough for you? Or are we going to say, praise God, Lord? Of course, we're going to say, praise God. Thank you for catching us away, right? Thank you for rapturing us. Thank you for saving our souls. But listen, there's more work to do for the Lord. Yes. There's a lot of work to, to do for the Lord. Amen. Very timely. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 19 through 22, speaking about Jonathan. And when thou hast stayed there three days, thou shalt go down quickly and Come to the place where thou uh, didst hide thyself when the business was in hand, and thou shalt remain by the stone easel, and I will take thee, take three arrows uh, on the side thereof, and as, as though I shoot at the mark. And behold, I will send the lad, saying, Go find out the arrows. If I expressly say unto the lad, Behold, the arrows are on the side of thee, take them. Then thou come, thou. Uh, for there is peace to thee and no hurt as the Lord liveth. But if I say thus to the young man, behold, the arrows are beyond thee. Go thy way for the Lord has sent thee. So you say, what are you talking about here? In 1 Samuel chapter 20, uh, Saul basically went to David and he told him, the way that I'm going to tell you if my father's going to try to kill you tonight or if he has peace in his heart tonight is I'm basically going to listen to what Saul, my dad, says. The conversation, if he's if he has anger in his heart towards you, if he's seeking still to destroy your life, what I'm gonna do, David, you go out and hide in the bushes, and I'm gonna tell my servant that I'm gonna shoot three arrows in the sky. And if I shoot the arrows and I tell my servant to come and to bring them to me, then you know that there is peace in the kingdom, and that Saul, my dad, will not kill you. But if I shoot the arrows far above the servant, and I tell the servant to pick up the arrows and to go his way, you know that there's no peace here. Look at verse 22. But if I say thus unto the young man, behold, the arrows are beyond thee. Go thy way, for the Lord has sent thee away. Remember, very timely, Jonathan was telling this to David to save his, save his life. So, John, so David knew at that word, at that saying, uh, that that wasn't the right time for him to go back to the kingdom because Saul was going to kill him. Let me give you B. B, you're filling the blank. We're almost done. Trusted. It was a trusted friendship. It was very timely, but it was also trusted. In the Old Testament, angels came to Lot and told him of Sodom's coming destruction. When Lot shared the news with his son-in-laws, his warning was discarded because of his poor testimony, and he was mocked for it. On the other hand, when David received the words from Jonathan, he trusted in his words. Now, we can take that for our own testimony. When you go and you try to warn people in a, such a timely time, right? Mm -hmm. Are people going to look at you and say, well, I've seen you in the bar. I've seen you in the casino. I've seen you smoking and drinking. And you're going to tell me not to do it? Do you have a good testimony? Can you be trusted? Or when you go and you warn others, can they step back and say, you know what, I've been observing this fellow. I've been observing this woman. And I've seen there's something different about them. They don't cuss. They don't smoke. They don't drink. They don't go to the casinos. They don't laugh at any of the dirty jokes. Maybe I need to listen to what this person has to say. Do you have a good testimony? Can you be trusted? Jonathan, when he says something to David, David took it to the bank. David trusted in what Jonathan was saying was true and that Dave, Jonathan wasn't a traitor unto him. He trusted everything that he said with his own life. Can we be trusted? You know, Jesus, our Savior, he could definitely be trusted. Amen.
There's a lot that we can learn from the life of Jonathan. He gave of his possessions. He gave of his time. He was very selfless. Took off of his royal attire and put it on, on just a teenage boy. Jonathan, just a shepherd boy. Right? He loved him as his own soul. He was a true friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's Jesus. That's our Savior. Jesus is such a friend that he sticks closer than a brother. Let's take some of these attributes from the life of Jonathan and apply them to our own lives, my brothers and sisters. Amen? All right, Brother Dan.